el Occupy generó Lumio, que es una herramienta que ahora se está usando mucho aquí, es decir, que digamos que el 15M como inspiró también o ayudó a inspirar Occupy, Occupy eh, genera Lumio, Lumio vuelve a nosotros, eh, sabéis que Lumio es eh, uno de los lugares de más usos del mundo, es España, y bueno, aquí está Richard, cofundador de Lumio, para explicarnos un poco lo que quiera explicarnos, le dejamos que hable de lo que sea. I like that, whatever I want to tell you. Um, I, I actually, I feel a little bit nervous today because, um, you know, Iago invited me to come and talk on this panel about tools. That was the, come and talk about tools. And I'm invited to talk about tools because I'm an engineer and I'm a co-founder of a technology company. Um, but I'm not really interested in talking about tools anymore and not really that interested in technology anymore. I want to... Um, talk about culture and about power. And I'm nervous because I don't think I'm very good at it. Um, but I think it's really important that the technology founders are talking about culture and talking about power because there's a lot of ignorant discourse about the relationship between technology and power. So forgive me as I learn my way into this role. I think it's an important one. Um, this morning we heard in the panel some of the threats of technology, the threats to democracy. So um, two that stuck out most pressingly for me, one was about total surveillance. So if everything we do is transparent, it's a, a weapon of control. And the other one was about um, inequity. So um, if the majority of internet, people accessing the internet happen to look like me, um, then people who happen to act like me and look like me are gonna have more power than others. And obviously that's unfair if we're gonna be running a democracy on those platforms. So those are real pressing threats and we need to engage with them seriously. Um, but my experience as an activist tells me that um, threats are not the only way to motivate people. You know, like there's actually another half of that coin. There's, there's the, um, the threat, but there's also the promise. And uh, I, I feel like to create a, a wave of change or a, or a movement, we need to ha have a balance of both. And so I wanted to try and illustrate a, a tiny bit about the promise of, for instance, what is the promise of having um, total surveillance? What is the, prom what, what is the value of um, doing things in public? Um, and, you know, one tiny example, Audrey's come and sat down and she's put this thing here, which is a camera that's recording in 360 degrees out to about this space, um, and it will be published. Our, our focus is just this range, so all your face are set. It's yeah. privacy protection. By default. So this, this is not just on stage because we're in a public meeting. Audrey pulls us out when we're having a private conversation. We don't have a private conversation. We just broadcast what we're doing to the web, not because we're so egotistical that we think everyone needs to see it, but because we think that by doing things transparently, we gain trust and we can learn from each other. So um, I, I, I guess I wanted to tell a, a little bit of my personal narrative so you can situate what I'm saying, um, because I come from a very bizarre place called New Zealand, and it's bizarre because it's like absurdly peaceful. So I have this very distorted view of reality um, where everyone is nice to each other and the cops don't wear guns when they walk around and stuff like that. <laughs> um, so a lot of what I'll say might sound like garbage as a result. Um, when I was um, graduating from university in uh, 2008, I don't know if you remember 2008, but there was this um, financial thing that meant that nobody had any jobs. So I graduated as an engineer into a market that didn't have any engineering jobs. Um, and so sort of by necessity, I discovered the open source hardware movement. So I was an electronics engineer, I was a musician, um, I wanted to make electronic devices for musicians, and I found there was this community that was designing, inventing, um, remixing these devices and just leaving them out in public and licensing them to be remixed. So I started participating in that thing where people were sharing their knowledge freely and, and just contributed to it on a, without really thinking about it. Um, and I think that experience gave me a, a particular, peculiar expectation about politics. I thought, well, if I can remix um, an electronics design, why can't I remix uh, a piece of legislation? Um, and why is this legislation centered on one geographical area when my collaborators are international? Why can't we do the same with legislation? Um, so I had this sort of read-write expectation about politics that wasn't matching the reality that I could see. And so when the Occupy movement started in 2011, I felt like 
a glimmer of, of recognition with what those weird people were talking about. We weird people were talking about. Um, so, yeah, I participated in Occupy, and like so many people that have participated in these um, horizontal movements, the experience was profoundly transformative to me. It changed my identity, it changed my behavior, it changed my culture, it changed my way of relating to people. Um, and, and so much of that I put down to the experience of sitting in a circle face to face with people and talking and listening. Um, in my case, it was more transformative to, to practice listening. Um, the problem obviously was as we heard yesterday, an assembly is not necessarily a great way to make decisions. It's a great way to build effective bonds and build solidarity, but it's not very effective for making decisions because you only hear from one person at a time and you only hear from the people that happen to turn up. So that's where the concept for Lumio came was, well, maybe we can do this decision-making thing online and make it more accessible to people. You can have people talking at the same time. You don't have to be in the same room. So we have um, sketched out this very simple tool, which is a discussion forum where anyone in the discussion can make a proposal and ask the group what they feel about it. Um, and, and we've had a continuous connection with the ongoing movement of movements um, to try and adapt this tool to meet their needs. And so that was how I met Audrey, who's going to give us a tiny introduction to it. Okay, so uh, in 2014, we occupied the Taiwan parliament for 22 days, and there's half a million of people on the street. And it's because at that time, the parliament refused to deliberate a trade agreement with China because they think Beijing is a domestic city of Taiwan. So the idea is that they refused the normal process about international trade agreements. So the occupiers occupied the parliament for 22 days, demonstrating how to deliberate about this kind of a trade agreement. So this is a constructive uh, demo of occupy. And at that time, the, nobody, including the police, know that people are doing such a thing. So when they arrive and set up this live video uh, streaming, uh, the police try to surround them. But by that time, we already have broadcasted to hundreds of uh, people, million people online, who all came to Taipei to counter surround the police and forced a truce. And so uh, the other uh, 20 days, people just started to learn from professional facilitators how to deliver about things like that and demo it on the street. And the GovZero Collective, the community, set up the uh, ICT connection to uh, broadcast everything uh, to everybody online, and including through people on the street and so on. And, but we have a problem because uh, like lawyers and physicians, we enjoy the privilege of this fast uh, track lane uh, because we're neutral, right? We protect the rights of everybody. But our uh, logo is Creative Commons. So there's a lot of people just printing them at home and putting them on the badge and say, hey, we want to join the ICT Corp. Now, many of them are well, like intentioned people, engineers, like thousands of people, but many of them are also just tourists who want this fast access lane. So we use Lumio and, and to, to have an online like decision, it, we start some, with some very bad idea like exchanging uh, Medicare cards or ID cards or driver license, which doesn't scale, by the way, and then uh, gradually grow into uh, like feelings, facts, feelings, facts, feelings, ideas, ideas, feelings, and finally we converge on an idea that everybody feels comfortable with, which is when anybody new shows up with this self-printed badge, we ask what's two to the power of 16. And if they can answer this question on the spot, they are an engineer. Welcome. <laughs> and and so, so that's how we very constructively use Lumia to solve this kind of collaborative decision problems. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Yeah. Um, and, and you know, well, of course, the um, <laughs> social movements are using Lumio. Also, the city governments are using Lumio, and the community groups and the businesses and so on as well. Um, but it's just in this context I'm most excited about the, the radicals in the streets. Um, <laughs> I, I, when I went to visit Taiwan in, in 2014 to meet with these people that were um, deploying our technology in, in such creative ways, um, I was warned, because it was my first trip to Asia, I was warned that I was going to experience some culture shock, you know, that this is going to be a very foreign experience. And, and the shock for me was just how familiar these people were, that we had the same, we had the same sense of humor, we had the same, um, uh, the same way of, of relating to each other with, with peculiar um, characteristics that are very common to me in the hacker community, but not so, not so um, common in my neighborhood. So um, then, then this trip, you know, this is my first time in Europe. I'm, I'm, uh, I was in Paris a couple of days ago and I met with um, Manu from the uh, Nuit de Boo movement. And once again, I had this experience of this person is like, my, my, I don't know the word for it. I, I want to say countryman, but I don't care for countries and I don't, I don't care so much for the, the gender bit either. But like, I had such a tremendous <laughs> sense of kinship with this person. Um, 
and, and, and it felt to me like we are, we're sharing a kind of culture that's non-local. And it's a kind of culture that is um, profoundly democratic. That's a new kind of democratic culture that hasn't been seen before. Um, Manu told us a story of um, what it had been like for him to participate in this horizontal movement. And his story was one of personal transformation, and it was almost word for word the same story as mine. He talked about how radical it was to spend a week just listening to people, just listening unfiltered to the experience of others. And, and he, he talked about how he, you know, how, how he cried at the, the beauty of people just expressing themselves, um, and how that has, has totally, you know, totally shifted his perspective on, on the world. Um, and how there's a, um, he's, he's in the Numeric Commission, so he's part of the, the group that is um, prototyping different technologies to support the social movement. And in, within the group, they're finding it very easy to collaborate. They're, 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 they're part of the hacker culture. They're already open source software engineers, so they have a, a set of behaviors that they know how to cooperate. Um, and they're finding that inside the group, it's operating really well. But at the larger scale, they're finding it much more difficult to adapt the technology to meet the needs of the people there. And they, what, what I can see, and this is just my reading of what's happening there in, in Paris, but there's this particular specific culture that is composed of specific behaviors. Behaviors like, um, okay, to organize information, I use hashtags. I don't use folders, I use a hashtag, which is a, like a democratic way of, it's, it's, they call it a folksonomy rather than a taxonomy. You know, the, the, the popular hashtag is the one that people are using, not the one that someone decided was going to be the right one. Um, we use collaborative documents. So when I'm writing a document, I don't own the, own the words anymore. We just share the words together until we get the ideas right. There's this, this idea that authorship is gone. Um, we do iterative development. So instead of um, abstractly trying to design what's the best possible set of policies, we just build the smallest possible thing and then learn from it and then build the next thing. That's a particular kind of um, attribute that a lot of people don't have but it gives you a tremendous advantage when you're trying to negotiate with power. Um, we've got this culture of disagreeing by contribution. So instead of just saying you're wrong, you say, I disagree, here's my proposed alternative. In, in software land, that's totally normal. You do it all the time. When you think you see a problem, you just propose the solution to it, and if people like the solution, it will come in. If they don't, it's ignored. And yeah, like I mentioned, we're doing this living in public thing where, same, same as with Audrey, when I met with Manu, we said, I said, do you mind if I broadcast this conversation? And there was, no, no problem, of course, absolutely. And that's very, that's very peculiar, you know? Most people are not that comfortable with the idea that what you're talking about, especially when it's about politics and identity, the idea that it'll be published and stored forever. But there's a benefit to doing it. So, yeah, I'm, I'm um, doing my traveling around the world thing and learning about different cultures and learning about um, how some cultures speak like this and, and some people speak very quietly. And, from meeting people like, um, like Audrey and like Manu and, and other participants in these movements, I guess it's given me a sense of really what that word means when you hear people talking about the digital native. You know, like it, that for me has always been a meaningless, a meaningless idea that it, it, what, whatever a digital native is. But what I'm seeing it is it's actually like, it's actually like a nation. Like it's, it's a, um, our collective identity is not attached to a geographic place, and it's not attached to a, a long history. It's attached to a history that's like 30 years old. Um, and, and it's got these particular characteristics as a result. I think it's got huge benefits, but it's also really naive and immature. And, and there's, a, there's a job to do to, to connect the, what do we know about geography? What do we know about material power? What do we know about history, and how do we, take that knowledge and experience and translate it into this new generation, which is a nation that is, you know, living in virtual territory. And, and when I say ignorant, I mean, you know, like the blockchain bros, who, who think that power and information are the same thing, and that bodies are irrelevant, you know? Like, there's just such an ignorant conversation happening in the world at the moment about blockchain, as if bodies don't exist. But of course bodies exist, and of course bodies have a tremendous impact on your experience of power. So we need to be having that conversation. Um, yesterday, Manuela Carmena reminded us of that great phrase about, you know, change, change is continuous confrontation. And I think, I think what's, what's coming down for me is that the, the, the kind of change that I'm interested in involves, like, it involves me continuously confronting myself. 
and each of us continuously confronting ourselves. And that's a, um, an attitude uh, which is, it's risky, it's vulnerable, it's threatening to yourself and to your ego, but it's actually beneficial for everyone. And I'm, I'm you know, I'm trying to practice it. And I think the technology can support that kind of self-subverting authority. So a tiny little technology that we have in, in Lumio is that we're a worker-owned cooperative. So instead of being a CEO, instead of having people work for me, I have people that work with me. And we, we're subverting my egotistical tendencies with that legal form that says, if you've been working with Lumio for a while, then you become an equal co-owner with the rest of us. So now we have 11 owners instead of one. You know? Um, so yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm up for the question, I'm up, I'm up for the challenge of how do we actually get these technology co-founders to have a clue about power and how it operates. <laughs> <laughs>